the escalator uh, website. Okay, I'll, I'll stop talking about that and I'd very much like to uh, introduce uh, our speaker of today. So Vanessa Yosa is um, an associate professor of English literature uh, and children's literature at the University of Antwerp. Uh, there she leads the ERC funded project, Constructing Age for Young Readers. She is the author of, amongst others, uh, Adulthood in Children's Literature uh, and edited the volume uh, Connecting Childhood and Old in Popular Media. So today she'll present Constructing Age for Young Readers, a digital approach. Now I'll stop my sharing, and then you can turn on your sharing, yeah. Vanessa. Right, can you see this? Oh. Yep, that looks fine to me. Can you hear me? Oh. I can hear you as well. Okay, I, uh, I wasn't sure. That's, the, um... <laughs> that's why I was trying to switch back to Zoom because I wasn't okay. sure if I, if ah, I okay. uh, was still muted. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, by the way, let me know if, if uh, I should turn off my camera if it's, um, uh, you know, if it's too um, uh, heavy on your internet connection, I can also just switch, switch, switch off my camera. Um, so I would like to start by uh, thanking Minu Van Zanen and the other organizers of this DH colloquium uh, for this kind invitation um, uh, and for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this research uh, to you. Um, in my talk to you today, I will be presenting uh, some results of the um, project uh, Constructing Age for Young Readers, uh, which started in February um, 20, uh, sorry, 2019 and is funded with an ERC starting grant. After briefly giving you an outline of the project as a whole, I will zoom in on one, of, uh, on one specific aspect, so the use of digital humanities to study age in children's books on a large scale. And uh, I've pitched this uh, talk for people um, with, with an interest, uh, but not necessarily um, uh, much uh, technical expertise in digital humanities. So I hope that's okay. If anything is unclear, feel free uh, to interrupt me and, and uh, ask for more specific uh, details. Um, so in this uh, talk, um, uh, I will zoom in on uh, studying age uh, in children's literature. And so far, um, most children's literature scholars have shied away from using digital techniques. So DH only features occasionally in journals and um, uh, conference papers in children's literature study. Um, uh, although uh, in the fall of last year, we organized uh, a conference on uh, digital humanities and children's literature studies. And it is clear that there is a lot of interest um, in this approach, even though um, uh, people are still developing uh, the skills um, uh, to be able to use them. Now, I will highlight the potential rewards of a digital approach to studying age in children's literature, but also address uh, some of the current challenges and limits that we faced in the projects, and also discuss, discuss and present some of the first outcomes of our research, uh, which still runs until 2024. Um, now, I want to acknowledge from the start that uh, this is not yet a lecture in which I will be able to present the final results um, uh, or that perhaps not even wide sweep sweeping results yet, we're still developing those, but rather I do hope that uh, these preliminary results will already be as interesting to you uh, as they were um, to our team. Uh, and perhaps we can also think of ways that we might collaborate yeah. uh, together. Now, uh, the project Constructing Age for Young Readers, or CAFIR for short, originates from the observations that there are still very big gaps in our knowledge of how age functions in children's literature as a whole. Um, uh, now, while various case studies have been analyzed, it's still difficult to get a grip on some of the larger trends in this field. And this was something that I really felt after finishing my book, Adulthood in Children's Literature, where I was left with some crucial questions which had bothered me while writing, 
Um, uh, but I felt that the approach of narrative analysis through close reading that I had used did not give me enough confidence to answer some of these questions. So one of my questions relates, for example, to the authors of children's books. Does their construction of age relate um, uh, to their own age? And does it evolve as they grow older uh, in ways that cannot just be related to trends in literature, but, but really to their own age? Now, from interviews, we know that new life experiences will sometimes change authors' views on, for example, parenthood or old age. And this is something that I could observe um, uh, in some of the authors that I studied. So for example, um, the uh, uh, Bart Mouillard, I think is probably um, uh, Flanders' most famous author of children's books. And he also won the Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award. So he's quite internationally known as well. Um, he's an interesting author for me to study because he already made his debut uh, in his late uh, teens and his early work is still very strongly connected um, uh, to specific teenage settings and themes. So they're situated in schools and they deal with first love or failing a year in secondary school. Whereas I felt that his later work uh, approaches childhood in a much more abstract philosophical way and uh, that these books are further removed from these very recognizable settings. Some other authors like Aiden Chambers and Hugh Skyer seem to stress nurturing bonds between uh, older and younger characters, especially uh, when they grew older themselves. Um, uh, but I was wondering if these were just coincidences, if, if these are just coincidental observations or whether they point at a larger trend. And so the research project Kafir uh, seems to uh, answer these questions, uh, amongst others, by exploring the full oeuvres of uh, authors with long writing careers during which they grew older. So uh, as you can see here for Bart Mouillard and the Dutch author Joko van Leeuwen. And so in addition, in, uh, when writing ad adulthood in children's literature, I also noticed some differences in the construction of age that were linked to the age of the intended readership of the books. And so, for example, I noticed that loving relationships between children and older characters were more frequent as fully developed storylines in books for younger children rather than for older children. Um, but since I focused in that book on children's literature in a narrow sense, that is without young adult fiction, um, uh, I, I became curious, but wasn't able to see how my ex observations also applied to literature for older readers. And again, um, you know, whether this was just uh, a coincidence, whether these were just singular cases or whether this was uh, a larger trend. And um, uh, so my curiosity on this account also ties in with two aspects of children's literature where further research is needed, I think. So first of all, the difference in the construction of age between age segments uh, within children's literature as a field and, and children's literature as a field is very broad. It ranges from baby books to crossover literature. So literature that is read both by children and adults. And second, uh, one of the big uh, questions that occupies our field is how um, uh, children's literature differs from um, adult literature. Um, so Kafir, uh, the project, uh, wants to study these, these questions about the age of the intended reader on a larger scale. And so for this reason, um, we also focus on um, books uh, written by uh, cross writers. So uh, authors who write for different audiences, children and adults, and within uh, children's literature produce children's books for different ages, um, as you can see uh, for Mallory Blackman here. And then uh, two final um, uh, aspects that Kafir will explore, but that I will not really address uh, in this talk is whether uh, and how readers differ in their response to the construction of age in children's books, depending on their own age. So here we have the same book being read by people of different ages. And then also how age constructs uh, from literature evolve when the books are adapted to other media. 
But um, since the methodology that we use for studying this um, uh, is not really digital, I will not really be discussing that today. So um, uh, when I mentioned uh, that when I introduced the research questions of the project, um, uh, I already mentioned that my current evidence was um, mostly based on uh, individual case studies. And so in order to raise uh, this research to a larger scale uh, and in an attempt to discover uh, bigger trends, um, uh, we're making use of a combination of close and distant reading uh, methods. And um, uh, with distant reading, I should perhaps say that we, um, uh, we follow the idea as it was first developed uh, by Franco Moretti as a concept that did not yet necessarily involve computers, but, but that rather distributed reading tasks uh, to different uh, um, people. Uh, whose results scholars could then use for a large scale analysis. So in, in Kafir, we adapt that method uh, by having all res researchers fill out standardized logbooks on the books that they annotate. Uh, and then um, uh, we use this, uh, these data also to um, uh, answer questions related to age. But of course, um, I, I, I wouldn't be speaking to you here if we didn't also apply a distant reading in the sense that it is now most used uh, today. Um, uh, so that is by using tools from digital humanities and have computers assist us in analyzing books that we have not all read ourselves. Um, so the aim uh, of the project is then to analyze a corpus of 750 children's books from Flanders, the Netherlands, and the UK uh, that have been published since 1970. Uh, and we try to have um, books that fit in to the different sub-projects as much as possible. Um, for my talk today, I will focus on the oeuvre of uh, one author in particular, uh, the, the author Hugh Skyer, a Dutch author, uh, who's won uh, the famous Astrid Lindgren Memorial Award, who's also an author with a very long career, um, uh, and uh, in his career he's written books uh, for various uh, audiences, so for various ages, so he's really perfect case study uh, for our project. Um, so Kair, um, uh, as you can see here, was uh, born in uh, 1934. He made his debuts, debut um, in the 1970s, and he's continued writing uh, since then. Um, now, since Kafir is focused on fiction, um, we've not taken into account his non-fictional work, uh, his essays, his poetry, and his short stories. But we've currently digitized 32 novels from his oeuvre uh, and uh, annotated all of them except one. Um, now, when I refer to his oeuvre in the rest of this talk, I do want to make clear that I, um, uh, that I mean his novels uh, and so that we don't, um, uh, that we haven't studied his essays, uh, picture books, poetry, and so forth. And also when I say we, I should clarify that, um, uh, uh, and here you can see uh, some of the covers of his books, sorry for, for only showing that now. So here you can see that he has published work. I think it's already visually clear that he's published work uh, in different time periods uh, and for different ages. Um, but when I say we, I should clarify that uh, Kaffer is teamwork. Uh, the, so we have a PhD student, Lindsay Heibels, who's carrying out the digital analysis together with um, her co-supervisor, my DH colleague, Mike Kestemont, and also a postdoctoral researcher in our department, uh, Wouter Haveras. And I've also included two interns in the slide, but in fact, we, we work with, um, uh, I think about now about two dozens of interns who've helped us uh, annotate uh, uh, the books. So, um, uh, let's now get into the more methodological aspects. Uh, so um, for our research, in some cases, we use uh, raw textual material, 
um, uh, but for most purposes, we um, convert the plain uh, text in TXT to an XML format uh, where we can enrich the text with annotations that later help us to select and analyze a specific uh, material. So for this, uh, we, we follow the conventions of the text encoding initiative, TEI, that has developed standardized rules for XML encoding. And we've supplemented these guidelines with rules um, that are really catered to the specific needs of our project and built a customized uh, Kafir schema. The digital texts have been obtained in various ways. So uh, some in digital format uh, through the publisher or uh, the Dutch digital library DBNL. Um, and others we've also scanned ourselves and converted with uh, the OCR software Abbey uh, to text, which uh, was then corrected. Um, and for the annotations, we use two XML editors, uh, Oxygen, uh, but also the freeware uh, sublime text. Now, um, what does this annotation uh, process involve? Um, so to the text, uh, we add various uh, tags. And um, uh, for those of you familiar with XML tagging, uh, you will know that these tags function as little labels that help to uh, single out specific uh, aspects of a text in a later stage. So, uh, for example, one of the things we're interested in are the explicit uh, age norms that are voiced uh, in the text, and we call these meta reflections, so passages in which an age norm is made explicit or where generalizing thoughts about a certain age or life stage are expressed. We put a so called seg about tag around them that specifies the age category that is um, uh, concerned. So the following examples from Hus uh, Kuyers, Krasse in a Tafelblad, Scratches in the Table Leaf, are all meta reflections on old age, um, uh, adulthood and childhood respectively. So old people die, that's just the way it is. Um, there we've added the seg about tag um, which indicates that this is a tag about an old adult. Uh, and so you see the same for adult and child uh, below. In addition, we've made a distinction um, in the text between direct and indirect speech. So for passages told by a narrator in the third person, we use this, the tag set direct is false. And for characters told, um, uh, or for passages um, expressed by a character, we replace false with true. And then we uh, add a so-called character ID um, that indicates uh, who is speaking at this point. So a dialogue introduced by the narrator um, uh, looks as, as you can see here. Um, so first the, the false uh, is the narrator speech. And then you see a dialogue unfolding uh, between um, Mother Leaf um, uh, that is interrupted uh, with um, uh, short instances of uh, third person narration. Then uh, for each book, we've also made a spreadsheet uh, that lists the character ID and matches it with a set of features for each character, such as gender, ethnicity, and age. Um, and when a story contains flashbacks or stretches over several years, the age of the character changes, of course. Uh, so in that case, we cre create separate ideas, IDs, sorry, for uh, the characters at each uh, individual age so that we can trace the age for each character in detail. And you see that uh, no information is listed here for ethnicity. Uh, this is because uh, we only uh, include uh, these features when they are made explicit uh, in the text, and, and that's not the case here. Um, for age, we, we do try to um, assign an age to characters, even if it's not mentioned explicitly, because our project is, of course, most uh, invested in studying age. And so in order to determine age, we've developed an age model that helps us to standardize the way that annotators attribute age to a character. And um, the rule that we use here is that we try to be as explicit as possible. So we use exact numbers when uh, the age is explicitly mentioned or can easily be derived uh, in the text. 
and we use life stages uh, when this is not the case. And, and we use them uh, in, in a way that's as refined as possible. So um, to uh, construct this age model, we've relied on um, theories from age studies amongst others um, based on this book by uh, Lorraine Green. Um, now for the attribution of age, uh, we rely on the information that the texts offer. So sometimes a character's age or life stage is mentioned explicitly, but more often uh, annotators also have to rely on the context. Uh, so, for example, characters who are attending uh, primary school are categorized as children in the broad sense. Parents are labeled as adults and grandparents as old adults, unless more specific information is given. Now, we do realize that this type of labeling uh, does not cover the diversity of age in reality. And so that's one of the limits uh, of the study. Um, uh, because, of course, there are also people who have children before the age of 20, uh, and not all grandparents will have reached the age of 60. So one uh, of the downsides of, of trying to work with these numerical categories is that we do um, uh, reinforce uh, age norms to a certain extent, um, uh, and that um, we realize that these uh, categories are also artificial separations that are needed, uh, however, to, uh, to prepare the texts for uh, digital analysis, um, which does rely, of course, on uh, countable items. Um, so here then um, you see uh, how we then move on from the annotation process to the analytical process. So from the annotated uh, books, we export these seg about tags that um, are put around these meta reflections. Um, we've developed a Python script uh, to do so. And so then we transport this information to a table. Uh, and so for each red meta reflection, we have information about the title of the book in which it occurs, the age of the intended reader of that book, the value of the about uh, attribute. So we know uh, which age stage or which age the meta reflection um, relates to. And then we also have information about the character that is expressed uh, this uh, thought. So we know what kind of book it is, who says it, about which age, and then uh, what is said. Now, uh, one of the uh, first observations about Huskayer's uh, work is the sheer amount of meta reflections in his book. So we've collected uh, 352 meta reflections for 31 book, and that's an average of 11 uh, for each book. Now, uh, for comparison, the Harry Potter series uh, by J.K. Rowling um, contains um, 67 meta reflections for seven books, so that is 9.5 for each book. But Kair, uh, unlike Rowling, never writes tomes of uh, hundreds of pages. Um, uh, so his longest books are limited to about 200 pages, um, which is even shorter than the first uh, volume of the Harry Potter series. Now, uh, 264 of these meta reflections can be found in Gaius children's and adolescent fiction, and 88 can be found in his books for adults. So um, we find meta reflections on all age categories, in Kair's children's, adolescent, and adult books. So this is already striking. He's clearly an author who is concerned with the topic of age. Um, and this is um, you know, consistent uh, throughout his work, this explicit reflection on age. And, and this, of course, helps us to um, uh, select authors um, you know, who, who are interested in, in, in studying explicit age norms. Um, so you see that you, the um, meta reflections on all ages occur uh, throughout his work, but it's important to note if we then look in detail that the quantity, the quality, and the content uh, differs. And, and the table um, that I've just shown helps us to uh, explore those differences. So um, first of all, um, uh, as you can see here, Ch uh, Kair's children's and adolescent books 
um, can contain uh, almost as many explicit assertions about adulthood uh, in the broad sense than uh, as they do about childhood in the broad sense. So um, the adult work seems to have a similar distribution at first sight, um, even though um, the chart makes clear that they obviously contain less meta reflections on age uh, overall. But if we look at the table and the content of these uh, meta reflections, we do see that the reflections in Carrier's books uh, for adults often evoke childhood to say something about adulthood rather than just to say something about children. So here are some examples of this. Uh, these are all meta reflections from his adult work. So when someone wants to leave, they duck and crawl out like a child between the legs. I cried like a small child. Nasta recognized the child in her that looks with longing eyes at birthday gifts still wrapped. So each time in these adult uh, meta reflections, childhood is evoked in a simile as a point of reference to say something about adulthood. And about two thirds of the meta reflections on childhood in Carrier's adult fiction are of this type and only roughly uh, one third really relates to childhood itself. Um, by contrast, by far the most meta reflections in his children's books concern, uh, contain assertions about adulthood uh, in its own right. So only a few times is children's behavior measured by the standard of adulthood. And, and these are two exceptions. Um, the phrases, you're acting like a grown up or you're acting like grown ups. And then uh, we walked uh, like uh, grown ups. So, um, uh, and this is interesting um, uh, for me, um, uh, for what it says about uh, adulthood, of course. So we have three of these uh, assertions where childhood and adulthood are being compared twice. Uh, this is said by a child and once uh, by uh, a teacher. Um, uh, and um, uh, so these um, meta reflections uh, express ideas about childhood. I, I can assure you that the first two, you're acting like grown-ups, is, is an insult. Um, uh, and the second expresses something that children find strange about adulthood, that they walk with no purpose. Um, uh, but um, what is clear from analyzing uh, the, the full list of uh, meta-reflection, and this is something I didn't know before, is that um, Carrier's children's uh, and adolescent books are much more invested uh, in reflecting on um, other stages in life than is adult literature, which is first and foremost concerned uh, with adulthood itself. Um, but it does also show that his children's books are not just reflecting on childhood, but also about adulthood and old age. Now, what about the content of uh, the meta reflections if we look at them at a, as a whole? Um, well, since they are so uh, many and they are so diverse, um, I will focus now on the meta reflections on adulthood um, in a, a more narrow sense um, uh, as they are expressed in, in Kair's work. So about 80%, and this was really striking to me, um, say something negative about adulthood. Um, and I've only counted about 20% of more um, positive or neutral uh, statements. And um, seeing them together is, is really quite striking because um, the books say um, so many different um, uh, negative things about a range of adult features. Uh, and this goes from the uh, adult's hairiness or silly clothes, um, uh, but most of them really relate uh, to a lack of control uh, that adults have over their feelings. So the idea is, is that adults are very easily frightened or scared or shocked and that they cannot endure, endure pain. So here I, I've listed some examples. Um, uh, this is first from Carrier's adolescent fiction, uh, where something, um, uh, the first one is about the adult body. It's not very flattering. Take the back sides, for example. Nobody considers as a 20-year-old that he will one day be dragging half a pig 
behind him. Uh, and then another to illustrate this idea of uh, a lack of control. Could it be true? Would adult pe people really be so uh, terribly childish? Um, uh, in addition, um, we see that um, uh, when, when adults are talking um, uh, themselves, um, they also uh, express certain age norms that can be quite limited. And, and so um, there are many instances where something is expressed about what adults can or uh, should not do. Um, so for example, it's expressed that adults should be married, that they're incapable of change and that they lack creativity. Um, in Krasse in the Tafelblatt, um, uh, the protagonist's mother says, I'm never afraid because that is not suited for grown-ups. Um, uh, and um, in, in other books, you see expressions like when you're an adult, you no longer want to play in the street and also the norm that uh, grown-ups should take care of themselves. Um, so quite restrictive age norms um, uh, and sometimes downright negative expressions dominate these explicit reflections on adulthood in Kair's works. And as such, I think they contribute to uh, a general aversion of adulthood or they can be read in the context of a general aversion of adulthood that Susan Neiman has also addressed in her book, uh, Why Grow Up? However, um, I want to uh, add two considerations which, which do complicate such an uh, easy conclusion. So on the one hand, the assertions that I've listed here uh, should be taken uh, with a pinch of salt. And this becomes clear, especially if you read them in context. Uh, because it is, uh, uh, you know, a logical consequence uh, of this digital approach that the terms and expressions that we extract are isolated uh, from their context. And so we do match our, our digital analysis with a close reading of selected titles where we see that many of these negative statements either appear in, um, in fights where insults often go both ways, or that, they are mar uh, or that they are expressed by characters who can be said to be quite unreliable. So uh, for example, an interesting um, uh, character is Polleke from uh, Hughes uh, Cares for Altet Sama Ama. Um, and uh, uh, Polleke is, is very negative about adulthood. And one, one of the things that she's disgusted by is adult hair, um, adult body hair and uh, nose hair in particular. Um, but her disgust of the adult body is so extreme that these meta reflections um, also serve to mock her and her restrictive views on adulthood as much as the adults that she's disgusted by. Um, nevertheless, um, I do think that uh, such parodies of uh, the adult body um, and, and these insults of the adult body um, they do remind me of what Linda Hutchin has described as the double bind of all parodies, that even uh, when they criticize something, they also affirm it. So they, they raise up what they criticize in the very moment of bringing it down, because after all, uh, only what is relevant to a certain culture is worth the attention that parody pays to it. And, and so only what is um, uh, relevant about adulthood um, uh, will be criticized by children in these uh, children's books. Um, again, that being said, um, explicit reflections on ages and life stages are also um, only one aspect uh, of the way that uh, the books uh, approach these life stages. Um, and in fact, uh, children's literature critic Peter Hollandale has argued that explicit ideology is far less effective in socializing readers than implicit ideology, um, because ex explicit ideology is in your face and, and um, uh, it invites debate and criticism. And we see that even in the book itself. While Implicit ideology, um, Hollandale argues, is often naturalized. It presented as you know, just the way it is. And so it requires more um, critical reading strategies to recognize patterns in implicit ideology and to question them. So 
in the next part of this talk, I want to see how, again, computational analysis can also help us to trace patterns, not just in explicit ideology, but also in the implicit age ideology that Carrier's books uh, convey. Uh, and here we then turn to the language uh, of the characters, their direct speech, uh, which is one way of um, uh, characterizing fictional figures implicitly. Uh, and so we are curious um, to know um, uh, how uh, and if the children's speech uh, in Carrier's books differs from that of adults. And so for this, we rely on uh, these um, uh, sections of direct speech that we've tagged. For what I'm going to present now, we're going to limit ourselves uh, to um, the vocabulary that the characters use. Uh, so first of all, we want to know, do characters use, do child characters use different words from adult characters? And uh, can we derive uh, anything from those findings about the topics that they like to discuss, uh, the register that they used, and the way that uh, their age category is shaped by this? Uh, so we developed a, a script for this uh, in Python again, uh, that can extract uh, all the text around which we put these said direct true uh, tags, and the script then matches the character ID here, uh, in yellow um, with um, the table that lists the uh, characteristics of each figure. Um, and so the, so the script matches the ID uh, in, in the two um, uh, sets, so in the, in the XML file uh, and uh, in the character list. Um, and um, uh, of course, then uh, we're able to uh, make use of the character uh, features that are matched with each of these character IDs. Um, uh, so I will show you how we do this here. So uh, I'm going to present you a rougher analysis of age, um, where we reduce the more specific categories in our model uh, by grouping them under two uh, broad uh, groups. Uh, so children and adolescents on the one hand, versus adult and old adults on the other hand. And so uh, this means that all the direct speech uh, can be grouped uh, under those two uh, age categories. And we do this via the character ID um, in the annotations and then the features in the character list. Um, next, we use statistical analysis to calculate and weigh the differences between the work frequencies uh, in this uh, uh, set with child speech and adult speech. Uh, and then we visualize the results um, using Jason Kessler's uh, scatter text techniques. techniques. And so the result uh, looks like this, uh, where the vertical uh, uh, y-axis gives you an indication of the relative frequency of words in child and adolescent speech while the horizontal uh, x-axis stands for the relative frequency of words in adult and old adult speech. And so it means that the zone in the top left corner contains words that are often used by children and adolescents, uh, but um, uh, in that are, um, that are, sorry, that are not frequent uh, in adult speech. Uh, and um, the bottom right zone contains words that adults often use, but that are um, not very frequent in uh, child and adolescent speech. And then um, uh, you see the top uh, right corner um, uh, contains words that all uh, characters of all ages use. Um, now, by clicking on the dots, uh, the program then uh, gives you a concordance tool, so then you can see all the instances where that word is used in the context, and you can also see which character uh, has uh, expressed it. Um, now, uh, we have faced some uh, challenges here too. So, uh, for example, the elimination of proper names. Um, so especially when you have a series uh, of books, and that's often the case for Kair, uh, those uh, character names can weigh uh, heavily on the results. Um, but we have developed a way of uh, filtering them out um, by making use of the, the character list. 
Um, but in addition, some terms are also very specific uh, to a single uh, book. And, and so they, if you don't know that, uh, and if you don't look at the words in context, it might be misleading. Uh, so, for example, Kerr has written an adult novel about slavery in which the Dutch West Indian Company features uh, very prominently. And as a result, the scattered text might give you the false impression that this term company uh, is typical of adult speech in all of his work, uh, while really all these instances just occur in one novel. And of course, if you click on the dot, you immediately see that. And, and similarly, um, one of the children in the Madelief books has a distinct interest in the painter Rembrandt. Uh, um, so you should not derive from this chart that all children in Kairos work uh, like discussing uh, 17th century art. That's definitely not the case. Uh, we're currently still experimenting with ways to downplay uh, these uh, book specific terms without limiting, um, eliminating them uh, from the scatter plot altogether, because we do um, think they are uh, relevant, even if they're just used in one book. Um, but that being said, uh, some trends uh, do uh, can be derived uh, from the scatter plot. Um, and uh, first of all, we thought it was interesting to see not just what divides uh, child and adult speech, but also uh, what they have in common. And so in the shared uh, zone, uh, we saw that um, the word ruzi or fight uh, features very prominently. Uh, and indeed, Kair started writing uh, his books in the 1970s uh, when intergenerational conflict was a very prominent theme in Dutch uh, children's literature. And um, characters in his works often have strong arguments. Uh, and this trend also is continued in his later work. Um, but if we then look at the differences, um, we can derive that the two age groups do not argue uh, or fight in, in quite the same way. So what distinguishes uh, the children's speech is the intensity and the colloquialism with words like um, uh, lame one, chicken, uh, no way, and uh, roll mop. And, and also words like shouted uh, are, are typically associated with child and as adolescent characters and point at children's frustration with each other um, uh, when they have differences. But the adult speech by contrast seems to suggest a much more persuasive discourse of reasoning through words like nitwar, isn't it? Uh, moreover, absolutely, and also the word trust. Um, so this forms um, uh, an interesting contrast, I think, with some of the meta reflections that I've discussed before, where the adults are often uh, accused of being unable to control their feelings. Um, their manner of conversation in the corpus uh, as a whole suggests the contrary. Um, but I think, again, uh, this is something that would be interesting to explore um, uh, in, uh, in a specific book or in a set of uh, specific book titles to see how the context uh, contributes to this observation as well. So with the analysis first of meta reflections and then implicit age norms uh, uh, expressed in uh, direct speech, we're gradually zooming out and, and finally, um, uh, with the technique of uh, stylometry, um, we will also explore um, Huskeyer's oeuvre uh, as a whole. So um, typical, for, um, typical of stylometry is that it works um, with raw textual materials, so uh, without annotations or human uh, interference on a textual level. Uh, and once again, uh, this technique is based on the most frequent of words and or word combinations. Um, so um, we used various parameters um, when doing our analysis uh, to test the robustness uh, of our results. And each time the result was indeed more or less um, the same. And for the results that I will discuss now, um, we used a, a Python script with SK Learn and uh, Skype uh, to calculate, uh, first of all, the 2,000 most frequent words in the corpus and then the proportional distribution uh, of these words in each uh, book. 
Um, just a moment, I'm quickly going to take a sip. Um, now, uh, by using this method, um, we have been able to reduce the weight of the character names, which I've uh, mentioned as a challenge uh, before. And also the novel specific terms do not uh, weigh as heavily because we're only working with the 2000 uh, most frequent words uh, in the um, uh, in the corpus. Uh, and so the script then calculates this uh, proportional distribution uh, and then visualizes the result uh, in a tree structure. Uh, we also use a technique which visualizes it in a scatter plot. Um, but here I will um, present the, the tree structure because it is quite uh, easy to discuss uh, the results uh, as they're visualized here. And so the, the tree structure gives you a, a visual impression of uh, the, um, uh, the stylistic similarities uh, between these different books. Um, so um, the, the closer uh, that books are grouped, uh, the more similar that they are stylistically based on these um, uh, uh, patterns of the 2000 most uh, frequent words. Now, um, why are we doing this? Uh, so the research questions that we're exploring uh, with this uh, tree is, um, uh, can the script uh, pick up on books that belong together in Kair's oeuvre? Uh, for example, because they are part of, the, of a series and, and where we expect them to be stylistically similar. Does, can, so we, we ask ourselves, does this uh, script recognize this stylistic uh, similarity. Um, but um, first and foremost, we're also interested to see whether the division in uh, age categories in uh, Kair's oeuvre uh, has an impact uh, on this uh, stylistic similarity. So is the division between children's, adolescent, and adult fiction in Kair's oeuvre also visible in a stylometric analysis? Or is the influence of the time period perhaps more important? And of course, also of Carrier's own age, is that perhaps more important than um, you know, the, the age category of the intended reader or the genre uh, or whatever? And so this is what the tree looks like uh, for Carrier's uh, books. Um, and uh, to answer that first research question, we see that indeed, uh, books that belong to the same series are grouped together. So the titles around Tin, Madelief, and Polica, uh, they're all part of the same cluster. And, and what I thought was even more striking is that there is one book in which Kair uh, mixes up um, characters from two series. Uh, it's called Tin Tuval and the Kunst van Madelief. And um, uh, that in the tree, it actually appears exactly between the Mother Leaf and the Tintuval books. Um, now the Mother Leaf group, group um, also contains uh, two other titles that are not part of the series, but that were also children's books uh, published in the same period. That is the period between 1975 and 1980. Uh, and similarly, um, the Tin uh, Tuval cluster also contains one book that's not part of the series, um, uh, but that appears in the same uh, time period as well. And the second consistent cluster is um, Geyer's books from, the, 19, uh, from uh, the late 1990s, so from 1999 to 2006. So here we have the Polica series, but again, we have two books um, uh, uh, the Book of Everything and Florian Knoll, uh, which are also clustered together with these books uh, published in the same time. So in all these cases, each periods um, and um, uh, so the age of the intended reader, I mean, the age of the author and uh, the, the period of publication, they all coincide. So this is a very logical and consistent image that we see. Um, uh, so it, it means that there is a recognizable style and topicality for each of these um, uh, periods and, and age groups. Um, but um, uh, I've not shown all the groups. And in fact, uh, the other groups are more diverse. Um, and this raises questions about uh, uh, these books that we can explore further. So for example, 
Uh, there's one cluster that consists of the early um, uh, adult novels. Um, uh, so, Dochtertje van de Wasvrouw and the Man met the Hammer. And then uh, the children's books, um, uh, Eend for Eend and Alle. And I do apologize for the uh, uh, somewhat offensive uh, cover uh, that you see here. I, I think it, it says something about uh, the, the, the period in, in which it was uh, published. Um, uh, but it, it might strike you as very odd the, that these two adult books are published uh, or clustered uh, together with um, two children's books. Uh, that also um, stem uh, from a, a different period. Uh, so one logical explanation that I see uh, why these books might be grouped together is that the two children's books are told by a first person adult narrator who presents himself as the uh, alter ego of the author. Um, and so while the books are all very different in content, uh, apparently, uh, or perhaps, uh, the, the choice for this adult voice um, is consistent enough uh, for the children's books to be grouped together with the adult novels. But um, an alternative explanation would be that all four novels, and this is perhaps surprising for the, other, for the two children's books, but that all four novels are very explicit about sex. Um, so uh, Kair in the two children's book anthropomorphizes uh, the adults, uh, the animals in the book. Uh, and so uh, he also describes their sexual behavior in great uh, detail. And uh, moreover, by anthropomorphizing them, he also uses human languages, uh, hu human language to describe this. So you see this here in Ola, he writes, dogs only fall in love when they are adult. And when adults fall in love, you know what happens. First, a bit of sniffing is enough, but soon they want more. Adults are rather simple in that. Look, Ola has a willy, of course, and Dean has a pussy. I don't have to explain that, a child knows. And the willy has to go in the pussy, of course. So you see that um, uh, while very different books in, in many ways, um, uh, the sexual language might be a reason uh, why the books uh, are grouped together. Now, the other cluster is even more heterogeneous. Uh, and so here I wonder what a children's book, uh, Papa is an Hund, which you see in the bottom row, um, is doing in the middle of Kair's adolescent and adult fiction. Um, its position here reminds me of a remark that was made by Stephen Kampa, um, that um, appeared when uh, Kyer's books um, were, were being published in the early 1980s. And uh, at this time, Kyer had become quite a beloved um, uh, children's author because of his Madelief books. Um, but some uh, critics argued that he was alienating readers uh, with his um, more recent books at the time, which were a lot more uh, controversial. And so Kampa argued that uh, Papa is an Hund is, was really a, a, children, an, a book for adults uh, that was masked uh, as a children's book. So a, a book for adults that presented itself as a children's books, uh, children book. And, and he asked, um, you know, the question is really whether you help a child uh, by offering uh, such a story. Um, so uh, stylometrically speaking, uh, Kampe is right in putting this specific title in line with uh, Carrier's books for adolescents and adults, but um, uh, I, I don't think the argument really holds because uh, other critics also made uh, the point about another book by Carrier, Who Mieke Mom Harma van Moeder Vindt, which is really placed squarely, squarely amongst uh, Carrier's other children's books. Um, now, the cluster does suggest, uh, and this is perhaps a more important observation, that Kair's adolescent fiction in general does resemble his adult fiction more closely than most of his children's fiction. So the organization is not completely random in this cluster. Um, so we see a logical combination of Isabel van Tyrus and the Redder van Afrika, which are two uh, historical novels for adults published in the late 1980s. 
And also two pairs of adolescent novels from the 70s, Een Gat in de Grens and Drie Verschrikkelijke Dagen, and also a cluster with adolescent fiction from the 1980s, The Zwarte Stenen and The Neuswotenvleugel, respectively. Now, uh, somewhat surprising here is the position of Het Vogeltje van Amsterdam, which is a novel published for adults from 1992, uh, which is placed here, clustered here, with adolescent fiction from the 1980s. Um, now, um, I think this is an interesting question to explore in further research. Uh, so uh, we want to subject this book to close reading um, to check why this might be the case. So one of the striking uh, um, uh, observations that we saw in the meta reflections for this book is that the protagonist is often compared to a child. So we wonder if this might have an impact. Um, uh, potentially this book was also written much sooner before it was actually published. So that might be another uh, explanation. Uh, but we also want to read into this um, more carefully to see what other aspects might be uh, specific to this book at Vogeltje van Amsterdam to see why it is clustered together um, with his adolescent fiction uh, from the previous decades. So then um, I come to my conclusion. Um, uh, so the digital uh, tools that we've used so far for the analysis of Kerr's, uh, of Kerr's oeuvre have helped us to verify results uh, from case-based research. Uh, in particular, some of the findings that I had for my um, book, Adulthood in Children's Literature. And um, we were able to see if some of them extrapolated to a larger corpus. Uh, that also included books that not every researcher in the group uh, had read uh, for, for themselves. But uh, as I show here, much more can be done uh, with uh, the analysis. Um, perhaps I should mention that we have developed one technique that I've not presented here for reason of time, and that is a grammatical parser that we've developed and that, does, uh, that allows us to explore which adjectives, verbs, and possessions are typically associated with each age group. Um, but uh, I also wanted to highlight some of our future plans um, uh, to see uh, what, what lies ahead of us in this project. Um, so first of all, we want to know if uh, some of what I've presented today can be extrapolated to a larger corpus. Um, uh, and um, uh, in addition, we would like to experiment with so-called sentiment analysis, where we use scripts to calculate the sentiments that are um, uh, expressed with regard to different age group or by characters in different age groups. Um, so we want to map sentiments about age uh, and see if they reflect tendencies that contribute to answering uh, our bigger research questions. Uh, in addition, we also want to submit the books and our extracts from it to top link modeling. Uh, which does not just map the use of words, but also of words group that typically cluster together if they cover um, the same topic. Um, but this is uh, somewhat difficult because um, uh, so far uh, a topic model specifically developed for children's literature does not exist. So we are experimenting with um, uh, developing such a topic model specifically for Dutch and English children's literature ourselves. And then finally, we would really also like to break down uh, our results to see how age intersects with some of the other identity markers that we include in our character lists. Um, and uh, so, for example, uh, the scatter plot that I've shown you uh, showed an interesting uh, difference in the use of laughter. So the, the, the way that uh, children laugh is typically uh, he he he. Uh, so he 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 is never seen uh, with adults, uh, whereas ha 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 is distributed more or less equally over children and adults in uh, Carrier's works. Um, but if we then look into the details of this, we see that these results are also clearly gendered. So most of the children whose child figures who said he, he, he in Kyra's books were girls with only a few boys using it, while ha, ha, ha 
occurs across gender and age. Um, so a bigger corpus and more sophisticated statistical analysis will help us trace patterns like this uh, through various age categories and also pick, pick up more on, on the intersections uh, between um, character uh, groups. Finally, I want to stress that Kafir does not see quantitative analysis as a replacement uh, for longer established methods of narrative analysis, but rather wants to add um, uh, to this and use both uh, reading close and distant reading strategies in complementary ways. Uh, so not only the trends, but also the exceptions are interesting. And some of our results raise new research questions about books that we did not realize were exceptional, like a Vogeltje for Amsterdam, Van Amsterdam, for example. Um, moreover, for now, we're not yet implementing di digital tools for the analysis of the pictures. Um, so many of these books are illustrated, um, uh, but so far we are still in the experimental stage of also annotating illustrations uh, and seeing how they can also be analyzed with digital tools. We do consider illustrations, of course, when we do close readings uh, of the text. And especially Manso Post's illustrations to Hughes Carrier's books were an important element of his success, uh, and they've been reprinted with each edition. So uh, we, we do aim to match our digital findings uh, of the, on the textual level with the visual level uh, as well. So in short, as you can see, we have a lot of work to do, um, but, but we're excited uh, about it. Uh, we're, we're also having uh, fun in this adventure. Uh, and I'm also very curious to hear your questions and your comments. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I thought it was a wonderful uh, presentation. There's a lot of information there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I actually have a lot of, I, I think there are a lot of things we can talk about as well, uh, but, but I'd like to see if there are any questions from the audience. I know that we are running a little bit over time, but I hope people still have time to stay oh, and sorry. Uh, ask questions. No, I think that's fine. There's just too much to to talk about, I guess. <laughs> oh, and I now see your pointer about the time. So sorry, Menno. I, I missed yeah, I it think because that's... I was in presentation mode. Mm, that's the problem with 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 Zoom. Uh, are there any questions from the from the audience? Uh, good morning, uh, Vanessa and Menno. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, talking about uh, youth literature, I know um, I'm actually helping Menno with a few Afrikaans uh, novels. Mm -hmm to read and practice his Afrikaans. And uh, personally, I prefer youth novels because it's actually, <laughs> in my experience, written more for adults than it is mm. written. <laughs> uh, because it's written by adults. So there's a lot of things, you know, when they think of their childhood and it comes through the youthful characters reflecting on age when they don't really have that age yet. So mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa, I was just, um, yeah, I'm intrigued by everything you're doing. Uh, I'm not working on literature mainly, but I do dabble. And um, yeah, uh, I enjoyed the reference to Harry Potter as well. So looking forward to looking what you are doing. Yeah, sorry Thank for you. the question, just a comment. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cool. And it's, it's, it's true what you say, uh, the books are, are written by uh, adults. Um, uh, and uh, although in the corpus, we also have some um, young authors, like uh, authors who were already publishing books as teenagers. Uh, and so it's also interesting to see how they do things uh, slightly differently. Okay, are there any... Other questions? I mean, I have a lot of questions, uh, but I, and I think we should also take this uh, forward a little bit later. For example, the topic modeling, I find really interesting. You didn't even talk about that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was also kind of interested in, interested in some of the practical things. So you're annotating these books. And at first I thought the annotation is just kind of a high level, you know, this book is about this and blah, blah, blah. But it's very detailed. 
Um, how much time does it take to annotate a book? It, it, it does take uh, it does take a lot of time. Uh, well, it, it depends because um, some children's books are, are fairly short. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it's, some of them are quite simple in terms of the time frame. It, it gets uh, intense when the book, uh, like, for example, Harry Potter, you can imagine um, it, it spans several years. So all the characters each. So we keep track of that. Um, uh, some books, uh, and like Harry Potter, again, is a good example because it also has various flashbacks, uh, which means that the annotator creates different uh, character IDs uh, for all the characters in all of the flashbacks. So, so it is slow, um, uh, but um, we also see it as, um, as a way to reflect on age. So, so um, some of the interns and students who do the annotations about books, um, uh, annotate a book and then also write a paper on how the annotation process has helped them reflect on age. And, and uh, so, so it's also an exercise in close reading of age. Um, uh, but it is true that it is a very time consuming uh, process in which, of course, the human factor is, is also um, uh, important. There is a level of interpretation involved inevitably. Yeah, no, I can I can completely understand. Mm -hmm. um, just looking at the chat, so I don't see any questions there, so I I just continue asking my mm -hmm. questions. So I do realize that, that we we're running a little bit over time. If people want to leave, then um, yeah, I, yeah, I can I can understand. Um, and now I forgot my question. So oh yeah, so I, I remember again. So you're annotating these books that are still copyright protected. So how do you handle that? So this is not a date. I mean, a lot of work goes into this data set, and I think it would be wonderful if that could be shared. Mm -hmm. But I also realized that it might not be able to be shared because of copyright uh, no. parts. No, so what we're thinking is some of these books are freely available through the Dutch Digital Library. Uh, and so we're currently uh, finalizing the website of our project. Um, and so um, uh, I will try to get uh, permission, and I think I should be able to get permission to share this um, uh, work because the texts are freely available anyway. But uh, indeed, um, uh, most of the other work uh, has to stay within the research group and, and we'll have to stay there for, for many more years um, uh, because it is still protected by uh, copyright, absolutely. It's, uh, perhaps I should also mention that we're only annotating a segment of the corpus. Um, uh, so we're not annotating the entire corpus. Uh, that's why the topic model uh, is so important. But, but we are facing challenges. So right now we're doing, we have done analysis with copy, uh, topic modeling. Uh, but this was based on the so-called books corpus, which, which is a, a topic model developed on the basis of uh, fan fiction. Um, but the, the words that uh, very often occur in fan fiction are uh, quite, quite different, although my, my presentation might have given you a different impression. Uh, but, but we know that a lot of the material in the books corpus is, for example, quite pornographic, um, uh, not, not only pornographic. So you do get interesting topics uh, that do apply to some of our uh, books. Um, but, but we still think it would be most relevant to, to also have a topic model specifically developed on children's literature and then see if we might get uh, more precise results. Okay. Yeah, now I understand. Thanks. Okay. I'm, I don't see any other questions in the chat. I think perhaps we should just stop uh, here. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to to seeing what if we can uh, get some research done together as well, um, because I think the the whole project sounds wonderful. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so I think and thank you very much for your presentation. I, I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So I'll stop the recording here uh, if I can find the right button. Thank you, everyone. And again, sorry go. for going over time. Uh,